And to be sat out there, you know, knowing you have the capability, but you're unable to do it at the time is a horrible feeling because you just think, you know, like, why is this not working? I started getting real annoyed at myself, you know, and I started just, just sort of being like, why is this not working? Like, why can we not get him in? Like, um, you know, any sort of normal time, it would just be easy and we'd fly in and it'd be done. It was frustrating. It was disheartening. It was, you know, it's what we train to do every day. Why, why isn't it working? You know, why can't we just go in? I just want to go in now, you know? RNLI lifeguards patrol over 240 beaches every year to keep more people safe by the water. To be a lifesaver, lifeguards rely on their training. It's vigorous. It's world class. It's what gives a lifeguard the skills to know exactly what to do when a life is on the line. So what happens when all you train for doesn't go to plan? How do you save a life then? I'm Jasmine and you're listening to Lifesavers, the podcast from the RNLI. Today I want to take you to Cornwall. There's someone I'd like you to meet on the beach at Morgan Porth. He's been coming here since he was a small boy. This is John. I've been going on that beach since since the 70s, since I was like five years old. Um, I've gone down every year, been in that. I have literally spent hundreds of hours in that same water. Um, and I know that it gets ripped and I've I've seen people rescued, I follow the news I and mean, I subscribe to all the local news feeds and things. It's not somewhere I've, I take it lightly. Morgan Porth is like a second home for John, a retired police officer who lives in Yorkshire. Having spent over 25 years serving on the police force, John had to end his career early due to a terminal cancer diagnosis. And last summer, he was on holiday with his parents in the very place where they'd always holidayed together as a family. There isn't a cure for John's prognosis, but the water provides some therapy for him. He no longer has lymph nodes in his stomach or his right leg, which limits his mobility and can cause swelling. So the water helps give him some relief. The, the, the salt water and the paddling and the action of the waves is good for the lymphedema, the build-up of fluid in my leg, because it's, um, it's not a circulatory system, it's, a, it's like a capillary system, so it's moved about by motion in your, in your body. So anything that it's, it sort of helps the... It's quite good therapy to be in the water. Last summer, when John and his family were staying at their holiday rental at Morgan Porth, they were able to extend their holiday by another day, thanks to a last-minute cancellation. It was the perfect excuse to get one last escape to the water before heading home to Yorkshire, especially as the summer was in full force. Yeah, it was a beautiful summer's day in Cornwall. Um, nice and warm, sun was out, blue skies, beach was really busy. It was just one of those sort of seamless mornings. Yeah, the weather was nice. Um, yeah, it was, it was just like a, a day that everyone would want to go in the water, but you can never tell. That's Alex, and before him we heard from Tori. Both of them were lifeguarding the beach that day at Morgan Porth with their team Tom and Teresa. Alex and Tori were patrolling from the water's edge, while Tom and Teresa took a wider view from the back of the beach at the lifeguard hut. Because we've got such a big beach at Morgan Porth, um, we do sort of uh, shift at the, at the shoreline and at the lifeguard hut. So I just uh, swapped over with uh, Tom and Alex was already down there. As the day went on, the water started to get choppier, but all four lifeguards are incredibly experienced in their jobs and as water users, and they were comfortable to take on whatever situations the sea might make them face. We knew the conditions were getting a little bit worse and we could see the water getting a little bit worse, but we just, we knew like we were fine and capable of what we were able to do to be able to do our job, you know, with, with the training, you know, that we put ourselves through. So, you know, we are we always in the water surfing like we've always I've, I've surfed for years so i've always been in waters where it's like you know out of your comfort zone where like going from waves that are massive to being in sticky situations in the water 
you know, we've always been water people, you know, especially the people that were on that beach that day. Um, and we always, you know, we're always out the rescue boards practicing and we all work amazing as a team. And um, so we, we all knew that like, we're capable with whatever we get thrown, thrown at us today. John also knows this beach and these waters well and he felt comfortable enough himself to go into the water. We seen him walking down because he had a distinctive leg. He had a black, um, it was like a, uh, like almost like a bit of thermal on his leg, which was basically, I think, from his treatment that he'd had, he'd had a lot of toxins built up in one leg, so one leg was bigger than the other. And, um, yeah, so that was, you obviously, you know, you notice things like that when people get, you, 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 you know, you scope everyone. So yeah, I was that, so that was it. I mean, I've just gone down there for a, just a little bit of a, a paddle. I was going to go no more than about here, um, just letting the, letting the waves move, thing, you know, move me about and, and just enjoying it. And, and then suddenly it was, yeah, it was like standing in a, I don't know, trying to trying to walk up a, a, a water flume. It was that sort of, it was that quickly. You know, the current had obviously just moved into where I was, or I'd moved into it. I don't know, but immediately knew I was in trouble, you know. When a rip current takes hold, even the strongest, most competent swimmers can't swim against it. And John suddenly went from waist height to not being able to touch the ground. Even, even with my sort of size and weight, there was nothing, it wasn't making any difference, so... I went into, um, I tried to do the, got, went onto my back, which is I know is what you're supposed to do. Went onto my back, tried to go parallel to the shore to try and swim across the rip to come out of it. And it didn't didn't work. It just continued to take me back. It was, um, I think Tori said it was, a, there was like a, an adjacent rip or something. I don't know the, this must be a technical term, but there was, I think it was a perfect storm kind of thing from what she said. Um, um, and it just take, it was taking me further and further out, and, and very rapidly. Um, I, I, when I got when I managed to build a glance back, I could see that I was a ridiculous distance from the shore already. So I noticed a member of the public sort of we sort of say they cough away to the back. So when they're facing back to the beach, and a wave hits them from behind, it's a really key identify that they did not sort of want that to happen. They weren't expecting the wave or they were not necessarily in a position where they wanted to be there because the wave's slapping them in the back. Usually you want to jump over it or swim under it um, and avoid sort of getting pounded by the wave itself. So that's when, yeah, I noticed John sort of take a wave to the back. And me and Tori sort of looked at each other and was like, like we're going to have to go here. And, um, and so I'm like, right, sweet, I'm going to run in. Alex went into the water with his rescue board while Tori kept eyes on John from the shore. Alex's plan was simple. He needed to get John onto the rescue board and let the waves wash them in. It's a strategy that has worked on countless rescues before. But as soon as Alex got into the water, something didn't feel right. So I had a feeling... So what, what is a good example is that, like, so say sometimes if I go out for a surf and the waves, you know, are quite dangerous, are quite big, or it's over, like, rocks and, you know, there's, there's quite big waves coming in, you get a, a sort of feeling where you're like, right, I'm not too comfortable, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out. And that's the feeling, and then you just get out. It was like that, but we couldn't get out. Mm -hmm. So it's like being, in a, being, putting ourselves in uncomfortable positions that you have to overcome that fear and overcome that feeling of... Um, you know, not wanting wanting to be in that position because there's somebody else's life on the line here. And you have, the, uh, me, and, me and our team, we all have the capability to, to save this person. And, um, and that's obviously our job at the end of the day. Seconds after Alex had gone in, Tori knew she had to follow. Pretty much by the time Alex got his toes in the water, I uh, radioed Teresa and Tom at the Beach Lifeguard Unit and said, yeah, I'm going to have to go in too, just as backup, can you please come and back back me up and watch the area? It's better to be, to over-exaggerate in a situation than sort of be like, oh, that might be okay, you know? So it's always yeah. better to overcompensate, over, over, you know, show lots of urgency always, because at the end of the day, it, it could just be a few seconds if you're too late. 
yeah, as soon as I saw him, it was a virtual sigh of relief. And uh, so when I saw him, I'm like, right, thank God, you know, somebody's here that knows what they're doing. Um, joined us. I mean, Alex wheeled round, tried to grab my hand. We kept getting separated because it, it, the swell was so strong. Uh, and the washing, Tori described it as being like being in a washing machine. Tori and Alex reached John in the water and there was no time to lose. They needed to get him on the rescue board fast and get back to shore. I'm there first and I've, I'm sort of like, we, we sort of, you know, we're trying to get John onto the board but the conditions, they're so big and, you know, there's, there's like big swell coming in, a lot of water moving about. And what happens at Morganporth on the sort of low tide is there's a big cliff. So when the waves hit the wall, they come in sideways and it's like a teepee. So we had like waves coming in this way, like from front, from the side. It sort of like pushes up and creates like a wave that's double the size of what it normally is. You've got one goal right there and that's to bring the patient back to shore. So you're not even thinking about all the other elements and variables involved in terms of temperature and you, you know, I had a job to do instead of Alex. With the waves so large and coming at them from all angles, Tori, Alex and John tried to let the motion of the water carry them back to the shore on the rescue boards. But the sea had other ideas. It's the thing was is that what was weird for us was that normally you get pushed in, but we didn't get pushed in at all. We, if anything, we were going further out to sea and pushed along. So it was like one of them where it's like there's waves, but for some reason we're not getting pushed in. Because our tactic at first was obviously get them on the board, catch a wave in. And that wasn't working because of the conditions. You can't always get everybody on perfectly. And, and I've sort of looked at her and just said, you know, we're just going to have to try and get in. You know, just you hold him, I'll hold the board. And we're washing. So we're like, yeah, sweet, that'll work. We just have to take a few on the head and that's just how it's going to happen. And at this time, sort of John's getting slowly and slowly um, more tired. As John began to lose energy, Tori and Alex knew they had to keep talking to keep him alert and to give him a fighting chance of escaping the waves. For such a big guy, and to, for somebody who's, who's gone through a lot and, and it tries to be fairly confident, I have never felt so small as I was in the water because you're completely insignificant, the power and the, and the size of the, of the waves have been sucked under. You know, from John's perspective, he's the two lifeguards right now, so where our goal was to one to get him back to safety back to shore, but in that for enable us for for us to enable us that to happen uh, was through clear communication to John. So throughout that whole um, rescue, it was just all that all that self talk one for Alex and I, but also to John. John, you're doing a really good job. Hang on. All I want you to focus on is hanging on to your hand. We're going to get to the beach soon. Just hang on as tight as you can. And he listened to every single thing that we said, like to the to the point where he was literally almost unconscious, and he was still listening to what we were saying, just basically telling them that he was in good hands, and that you know, no matter what, we were going to get him in, and that like just you just keep trying and keep pushing, and you know we're going to get you in, and just don't worry, and just you know relax, and just keep swimming with us. I'm a big believer of like sort of sticking to my word, and it was like you know, you, like you, you don't really have a choice here. If you reassure somebody that, you know, they're going to be fine and, you know, to, even to the point even where if you don't believe it yourself, you're just still reassuring them because it's, it makes you feel comfortable and it makes you feel like, you know, more involved in the situation. You know, if I put myself in John's position or um, I would want to hear, you know, it's that reassurance. It's, um, it, you know, gives you confidence, gives you hope, it gives you strength. Obviously, it was a very, very scary situation to be in for all of us. But just, you know, float around those words of positivity, perseverance, you know, just reassure, I don't know, just, it just adds all those little two percenters to, uh, to help with the mind in those situations because it's very easy to just go tunnel vision. Um, and I've seen it. I've seen it with patients who I've rescued in not necessarily as bad or tough conditions whatsoever in a, in a relatively calm environment. Some people just go tunnel vision, they get the wide eyes, they get the panic and the fear, they get the lump in their throat. We call it they climb the ladder in the water, so it literally looks like what it sounds like. So instead of you know trying to remain calm, float to live, 
they're splashing around trying to grab anything, you know. So, wow, credit to John. He remained so, so calm in such a scary situation. He couldn't have been a better better person to, to um, you know, go through this situation with. They were awesome. As I say, I've come from, a, from an emergency services background. I mean, I've, I'm used to being thrown into very, very fast changing situations where other people's lives are at risk, your life can be at risk. You've got to make some very fast tactical decisions and you've got to make decisions that, you, you know, you could be held accountable for, you know, years down the line in some cases. Mm. Um, communication is always the big thing, you know, because unless you're all talking to each other, and you're clear and you're keeping each other updated with what you're doing, uh, then it all breaks down. And the fact that they were able to keep me motivated, keep me up to date, keep, you know, using my name, doing all the things, keeping each other, keeping on each other, being aware of what each other's doing, absolutely fantastic. I mean, that that in itself as a, as a skill, as an emergency worker, is never seen anything like it. Alex and Tori are doing everything they can to get John into the shore. But every wave was pulling them further and further out to sea. And to make matters worse, a large set of waves was now heading towards them. All they could do was brace against the rescue boards and wait. We'd been trying to push in with the boards. And then this big set come in, and it was like a four to six foot set. So this set's come in now, and I'm sort of looking at Tori, and I'm just like, just, just shout, just hold on, like, like, just, just grip the boards. And I shout to John, I'm like, right, there's a big wave coming, like, this is gonna, you're gonna get hit by it, but we're just gonna hold on to each other. So I'm trying to hold on to two rescue boards. Tori's on one of the rescue boards, and I've got my legs wrapped round John. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, right, we're just gonna brace this wave, and I get hit. And I lose my board. And then Tori's gone on the wave because the wave's just took her and gone. So now it's just me and John and I'm, we just sunk. So I'm like, Christ, I'm, right, I'm, this is just us now. And I sort of come up to the surface with him and I just look at him and I look around and I'm like, this is where I'm gonna start feeling like, I, you know, this is, um, this is sort of quite an extreme something going on here. Did you feel scared? I don't know whether, yeah, I, I, I guess, yeah. I mean, it was more, I don't think I was scared necessarily for myself. I think I was more scared that I didn't want to lose, you know, John, and I didn't want to, you know, my worst nightmare would have been, you know, not saving this person's life. And that, that obviously, to a lifeguard, is your main part of your job. And to be sat out there, you know, knowing you have the capability, but you're unable to do it at the time is a horrible feeling because you just think, you know, like, why is this not working? I started getting real annoyed at myself, you know, and I started just just sort of being like, why is this not working? Like, why can we not get him in? Like, um, you know, any sort of normal time, it would just be easy and we'd fly in and it'd be done. It was frustrating. It was disheartening. It was, you know, it's what we train to do every day. It's us versus the ocean, and it's very hard to beat the ocean, fight the ocean. You know, Alex and I sort of looked at each other when things weren't working, you know, when, the, you know, our plan wasn't working. That's when you sort of thinking, right, like, no, I, I just want to go in, you know, and we're not going to go in. We're not, we're not going we, to leave John. There's no way in the world we're going to leave John. You know, we're getting him back to shore safely to his family. So that's, that's our goal. But why, why isn't it working, you know? Why can't we just go in? I just want to go in now, you know? While Tori is trying to paddle back to Alex and John in the waves, Alex has to come up with a new plan to keep John afloat without his rescue board. And the current was dragging them towards an area of the beach called North Corner. It's a notorious spot, even among locals, as a place you never want to find yourself in. If I went back to square one, which is what you learn in your lifeguard course, which is at the very beginning. And, you know, I went straight back to that old technique and it was because I'd lost the board. 
and I never thought I'd be swimming with somebody. So I'm now what is called a pistol grip and you basically have your hand like here and every time a wave comes you spin the person and you cover their mouth so they don't get any water so in your them. hand just for the listeners so your hands on your chin on my chin and cover like just literally almost like an L under your lips yeah and every time a wave comes you push your hand up and you cover their mouth so they don't get they don't swallow any water so when this was happening I was you know I, I, I then told John again I was like right like listen we've, we've lost the boards okay like it's going to be a bit more tricky now I was like but we're still going to get in like don't worry just keep trying with me as long as you're with me you're going to be fine I was like just 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 you all you need to do here is just use all your strength and every time I tell you to swim I just want you to try and swim and what I was doing I was I was literally swimming behind him and pushing him into waves but whilst holding on to him so I didn't lose him and it was it was at a point where I was like you know we need somebody to come out on a jet ski now. Like this is this is getting ridiculous. Like we've almost been in there for 15, 20 minutes now. All we're doing is getting further and further into that north corner. And as soon as you go in there, it's, it's almost game over. It's like, you know, it's just not a, not a good place. It's the sort of place you look at when you go to the beach and you're like, that is a horrible place to be. I've, I've always said it, I said, I never want to do a rescue in that corner there. Yeah, you know, and there we are heading towards it. As Tori reaches John and Alex again, she manages to signal to Teresa on the beach that they need more help. Until Teresa arrives, all three of them will be relying on the safety of one rescue board. Yeah, Alex lost his board, so then there was three of us hanging onto my board. And at that point, the plan was, okay, there's no way we're going to get three of us on a board. We're here, we can't get John on the board. So we're just going to hang on tight. Um, I was at the back of the board sort of grabbing the handles and stabilising from the back. Alex was up the front of the board with John holding off to each side. And we were pretty much the plan was to brace, brace each big wave and just keep bracing. While Alex, Tori and John are bracing against the rescue board, Teresa managed to launch the jet ski from the beach, otherwise known to the lifeguards as a rescue watercraft. There was an enormous amount of pressure on Teresa to help Tori, Alex and John get out of the water. So now we've got our reliability on the jet ski, which is like, don't mess it up because if this jet ski tips, we're all in serious trouble here. Anybody who wasn't 100% confident on that jet ski, like there's a lot of chances that they would have messed that one up. And luckily Teresa's, you know, one of our best jet ski drivers, I'd say from that day easily. And, um, you know, it's, is a big is a big thing that because you've got so much pressure on you to not mess it up and on conditions like that the waves are so close together that you've only got a few seconds a period of time to get this person onto the back of the jet ski it was such a feeling of relief for, for alex and i but the job wasn't done yet given the circ- uh, the conditions again um the job wasn't done we needed to get John onto the back of the jet ski, onto the back of the rescue watercraft, which is very, very difficult when we do have, you know, a short break between the breaking wave and very large breaking waves. So the skill required on the jet ski to, you know, get close enough to all three of us to then get John onto the back of the sled and then turn around in between waves is, is a really, really tough job to get done. That sled Tori mentions is a little mattress on the back of the jet ski. It has handles all down the side to help a casualty hold on while the driver powers them back into safer waters. The sled is where Alex and Tori had to get John to have any chance of getting out of the conditions. But because of the treatment John has for his diagnosis, he has lost feeling in his hands and to grip is almost impossible. Again, with the drip strength issue I've got, I lost, I lost grip on the first first attempt. And we just managed to get him on the back of the sled. So I'm like, right, sweet, this is it. We've got him on, relax. I'm like, don't worry now, mate. Like, we're going to be sweet, we're on, we're going back to the beach. Um, so Teresa's come round, and as she's going back to the beach, sort of quite fast, because she's got to run away from the waves, John's obviously getting dragged from behind. And obviously he's been battling in the water for, for you know, almost 20 minutes now. Um, he's shattered, so his grip onto the handles went grey, and he's he's just completely gone, and he's just taken it off, and he's come straight off the back of the ski. And that's when I had to pull the handbrake on the board, pretty much, had to you know pull off the back of the wave that I was on, and then 
drink paddle back to John. So that was probably one of the quickest outbursts of, uh, of paddle I've ever done. And we're back in the, the rip. We're both hanging onto the board. We're both, talk oh, sorry, I'm talking to John. He's saying a really good job. Keep hanging on. We're nearly there. Teresa's coming now, you know. Um, so we're getting pulled out again. You know, if you feel like something's too dangerous for yourself, you can back out. But I think, you know, from being quite strong-willed people, I don't think we was ever going to back out. Like, no, no matter what, I sort of I like, I'll go down either. with you. This is what's going to have to happen. Um, but I knew that wasn't going to happen. I just knew, I was like, that's not happening. Like, that's not a choice. Do you know what I mean? And you do have a bit of a bit of doubt in your head, but you got to overcome that doubt because at the end of the day, this is this is somebody else's life at risk and I have the capability, Teresa has the capability and so does Tori and we all have the capability to get him in. And I could tell Teresa wasn't, Tori wasn't going to give up and I knew myself I wasn't going to give up and I knew Teresa wouldn't give up. With John breaking away from the jet ski, Tori had made her way back to him on her rescue board. As they held onto the board, being dragged further back into the sea, Teresa and Alex were battling the conditions to turn around on the jet ski and try to reach them again. This time, Everything was on the line. If we don't do this, uh, like literally in the next go, like this is just like dreadful. <laughs> like, this is the worst position we could ever be in. Um, and I've told Teresa to go right in, and I'm like, right, just go right in, just breathe for a second. I was like, we've got to get this this next go because if we don't, like, I don't know what we're going to be picking up in the next way around. Timing was everything because of the volume and frequency of waves. Teresa, Alex and Tori had less than 10 seconds to get close enough to John on the jet ski, get him on the sled and power back towards the beach before the next breaking wave hit them. Teresa managed to get the jet ski right next to John and with the seconds ticking away, it was up to Alex and Tori to get John onto the sled and help him grip onto the handles. I've jumped off the jet ski, um, just gone behind him and um, tried to use a few techniques that we sort of learned and it's like going under his legs and sort of shouldering him on with, right. with his shoulder and Tori's doing the exact same as well. Alex and I used all the strength in the world that we had to assist John onto the back of the sled. It's, it's really hard to get one to the back of the sled at times, especially in breaking waves. But yeah, I remember doing just, I'm pretty sure I just grabbed John by his, you know, his shorts and just pulled so hard to get him up. You know, you just got to do what you got to do in those situations. And we got him onto the sled and I was like, just leap and grab the, the furthest one you can grab. So we literally just launched him on there. He's got the like second to last one. So we were like, right, it's going to have to do. I'm like, go, go, go. Teresa just sort of idled off. So the jet ski is like literally idling. And we, I thought we were going to come off on one of the waves. And she's turned around and we're literally the sled's like neck on with the white water of the way behind. And luckily she's just picked up the speed. I've literally got John in the headlock. Like I'm, I'm like, I've got him here and I'm literally just like, I'm not letting go of you. Like I was pretty sure I was choking him out. <laughs> and I'm like gripping on. I'm like, you just grip on, like hold on. And then with the speed of the jet ski against the water, John's shorts came off. I felt the shorts go and I, I just thought, yeah, that's just my look. <laughs> and then, um, it was only when it, I heard the engine cut out uh, or slow down. I sort of lowered my foot and touched something solid. That was like, oh, thank God. And I let go and stood up. And I was, you know, naked as the day I was born and uh, far less attractive. Um, but yeah, the, um, the Teresa was brilliant. She, she, I mean, she's a, she, again, they were all, none of them are big people. They're all, obviously, by virtue of what they do, very, very fit and very slim. And her, her, her vest was the size of, you know, it was like a glove for me, but it was still just enough to, well, more than enough to be fair, to, uh, to cover my modesty. With John finally back to the safety of the beach, the lifeguards gave him a full medical assessment. Remarkably, he didn't need any further treatment, and Alex was amazed. Thought they were going to be stretching me out, oxygen and straight to uh, Trulisk. Um, uh, he says he couldn't believe that I, I stood up and sort of, Got myself out and was chatting. He says, I, he says that, was, that was fantastic. You know, but yeah, I'm a Yorkshireman. <laughs> John, Tory, Alex and Teresa were finally safe. And while John was able to go home to rest and recover, 
the impact of the rescue didn't end there for the lifeguards. It struck us back quite a bit, to be fair. It was, um, we had dealt with quite, I'd dealt with quite a big thing at the beginning of the year, and that was something that probably should have stuck in my head a lot more than what that was, but that stuck in my head a lot more, I reckon. It's, like, there are seconds between being alive and dying in your arms, and it's, it's quite like a, a mad feeling, you know, and, and that night I just, you know, we, we all went down the beach and like a few of my mates and like we all just, you know, played a bit of the rounders on the beach and was mucking about and I didn't really speak about it with anyone because I just couldn't re really be bothered at the time. I was just like, I just want to get on with everything. And, you know, I went into the Domino's and brought a pizza that night and I was like, it's mad to think what we were doing like a few hours ago and, you know, you, you know, nobody knows that. And it was quite a surreal feeling where you sort of sat there like, you know, that's why you're there, you know, and that's why we do our job because, you know, things like that. I've done rescues before and I've come away from absolute buzz at night. Literally, you come, you come away and you're buzzing and you're like, right, sick, like, let's go back out, let's do another one. From that rescue, I was like, I never want to do that again. Like, that was like, that was like quite, quite scary. But then obviously that's like the, the same day, like within the next few days, I was like, oh, sweet, like, it'd be fine now. Mm. Like, it's just, but from that, you're like, Christ, I never want to be in that position again. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's scary, like, do you know what I mean? Because you are sat out there sort of, you, you know, you, all these different things are going through your head and, you know, you're just like, but nobody wants to have to, you know, see anybody struggle like that, do you know what I mean? Especially not something that's so, like, innocent and such a nice guy. I spend a lot of time in the ocean, um, you know, and I'm always trying to improve my ocean awareness and get more and more confident because I love, I love being a lifeguard and I love surfing. And part of surfing is surfing bigger waves and putting yourself in situations that are scary. Um, but yeah, I was, I was not comfortable in that situation entirely. And you know, when you're there reassuring a patient who. It's your job to get them back to shore safely. You know, you're telling them all these positive and reassuring things. But I've also got to say those things to myself in my mind. Obviously, we train to, we train for this job. And we, you know, we have trust in our training. We have trust in our team. We have trust in the organisation, the RNLI, that we're ready for this. This is what you know, part of our job is. Several months later, by a stroke of fate, Tori, Alex and John met again. I do remember a session, um, it, it was actually a couple of months later, that uh, Teresa and I, same beach, same crew, we were, uh, it was a really, really quiet, colder day in September. We, uh, Teresa and I went out for some training on the boards together and, uh, and that was the closest conditions that I'd been out in, in terms of similar conditions to the day that we rescued John and I remember I literally yeah just remember like having flashbacks when I was out there and at the time it wasn't so pleasant to be honest but it was really really powerful for me to push through that sort of discomfort and like flashback stage and yeah push through it and catch some waves and do some training with Teresa and I think that like really helped me in that sense where like, yeah, I did have these flashbacks, but I, you know, remained in that environment and pushed through it. And uh, it was like, well, and it was funnily enough, that day uh, was the, the day that John came back down to visit at Morganport. Um, and it was the first, I think it was must have been one of the first days that that, that team had worked together in, in months. The first day that we'd worked together, the day that I had flashbacks of the rescue with the most similar conditions. And John rocks up he doesn't he didn't even tell us he didn't message us he didn't call us he just turns up at the beach and he lives up country you know he lives hours and hours away and he was down on a holiday with his wife and he came down to the shoreline and it was the most powerful afternoon like I, I, I there was just so many emotions running through us all like we just wanted to cry we wanted to laugh we just like it was yeah it was such a powerful afternoon you, there's not a lot of words you can say in that situation um, to people that have literally just put their lives on the line for yours. Um, you know, I, I hope that they appreciate that, uh, you know, that much I appreciate what they did. If this story hasn't put into perspective just how crucial Tori, Alex and Teresa were to saving John's life that day, 
Since the rescue, the three lifeguards have been recognised with RNLI Awards of Bravery. Tori and Alex are being awarded with the RNLI Bronze Medal for Gallantry, one of the highest forms of recognition you can give someone for bravery at sea. Only a small handful of gallantry medals have been awarded to RNLI lifeguards in the charity's almost 200-year history. And Teresa is receiving a framed letter of thanks for the vital role she played in getting John and her colleagues out of those impossible conditions. I'd just like to read out, if that's okay, the official statement that explains why you guys wholeheartedly deserve these medals. For their courage, selflessness, determination and surf skills in challenging conditions, these awards recognise the sheer difficulty of this rescue. Tori and Alex willingly placed themselves in harm's way to rescue a stranger. Had they not acted as they did, John would almost certainly have drowned. And Teresa was absolutely instrumental in securing a safe and successful outcome for John and her colleagues. Her skill and her surf sense and intuitive actions helped save a life. I've actually got goosebumps. <laughs> I was I was really trying not to cry. <laughs> yeah, I, like oh, yeah. I've honestly got goosebumps. I've got yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's really nice oh. to, to hear that. You know, you, you can you can read about it or you can think it, but yeah, to hear it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's very emotional. I think we all definitely, as a team, you know, as you know, it's quite a big bonding thing because as a team, you know, we wouldn't have been able to do it without each other. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think we proudly give us, give ourselves like a little pat on the shoulder. And, but you know, at the end of the day, you can say that, but it's our job. Do you know what I mean? It's our job to do that, and that's why we put there. Thank you so much to Alex, Tori and John for sharing your story with us about how truly challenging it was to save a life when the sea was at its most unpredictable. The courage and determination from all of you is absolutely astonishing. If you've been inspired by this incredible story, why not find out how you could become someone's lifesaver? Find all the information you need about becoming a lifeguard in the link in the episode notes. And however you're spending your summer, if you're heading to the beach, make sure it's a lifeguarded one. You can find your nearest RNLI lifeguarded beach in the episode notes. Thank you for listening to Lifesavers, the podcast from the RNLI. I'm Jasmine, and Lifesavers is presented and produced by me and Adventurous Audio Limited. 